in today's class uh, i would be discussing the question uh, dickens's art of the portrayal of the underworld characters now this question was once uh, it had been set in the university exam so i think i would discuss this question with you and let us look at uh, how charles dickens uh, he has presented to his readers these underworld characters uh, we have done uh, the two topics we have uh, discussed that is oliver's character and uh, oliver twist as a social document of its times which is dickens as a social critic and now this is the third uh, topic that we will be discussing so let us move into the topic itself and as we uh, as we saw uh, we would have to uh, we would have to give the same introduction that how dickens was interested or how he wanted to show the london underworld and how it functioned by and he wanted to make people to make his readers aware of the fact that how uh, these people lived and how uh, they operated and it was a kind uh, the way in uh, which dickens wanted to warn the readers of their evil influences and in oliver as we know how dickens said shown this little boy as an embodiment of virtue and how even though he is placed in such uh, you know evil situations or places he survives now let us uh, try to look at some of these character uh, and the first character who Uh, of course who would grab our attention that is that is of course uh fagin the jew fagin the jew and uh, he is actually one of the main characters in this novel and uh, he might be called the second most important character after oliver and he plays a really big role in the in furthering the plot of this novel and he has uh, quite a big role now uh, dickens got the name of fagin from his childhood friend bob fagin and this bob fagin was his friend during his boyhood days and he had been sympathetic to him during his days at the uh warehouse where he was uh, engaged as a as a uh, you know the uh, job of in uh, pasting labels on bottles that was his job now uh, dickens has recounted about this and uh, how he had met bob fagin and how he took the liberty of using his name in oliver twist so uh, during those times in the victorian period there was a feeling of anti semitism that is anti jew jewish feeling and perhaps dickens was influenced by that and therefore in uh, chapter 8 of the novel that is the first time we meet fagin and uh, the scene is when oliver is brought to fagin's den by the artful dodger and uh, uh, we get the description of this man quote i am quoting from the novel in a frying pan which was on the fire and which was secured to the mantel shelf by a string some sausages were cooking 
and standing over them with a toasting fork in his hand was a very old shriveled Jew whose villainous looking and repulsive face was obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. He was dressed in a greasy flannel gown with his throat bare and seemed to be dividing his attention between the frying pan and a clothes horse over which a great number of silk handkerchiefs were hanging. So this is the first description of Faget. And uh, Dickens refers to him as a merry old gentleman. So that is the ironical description of uh, Fagin as a person who was a kind of a father figure to the boys of his gang. So the young boys who were being trained to become pickpockets, he was there uh, like a father figure. And he behaves most courteously with Oliver at first. And Oliver gets the impression that he is his friend and protector. Of course, Oliver is too young to understand that this man is actually, uh, he's not going to be uh, his protector. And uh, he does not realize even when he catches a glimpse of the expensive trinkets and watches which Fagin had accumulated by stealing and robbing. And uh, uh, Oliver is really amused to see the game that they, the boys play with Fagin and that uh, appears to him to be quite a curious and uncommon game. And actually it is a game uh, where the two boys have the task of robbing the gentleman uh, uh, or rather robbing Fagin of his handkerchiefs and uh, purse like that without Fagin being able to know. So uh, the old Jew was really training his, within quotes, hopeful pupils. So Dickens really ironically uh, explains this. And later on, Fagin is represented with animal imagery. He's described as a reptile. And as he uh, he's described as gliding stealthily. Uh, stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways. And he was really looking hideous. He was looking like a, he was looking like a loathsome reptile. And a thoroughly repulsive person. And uh, when Oliver is recaptured uh, from Mr. Bummer, Brownlow's house, uh, Fagin understands that he had him, had Oliver in his toils and uh, in that dreary place, uh, obviously Fagin tries to make him into a pickpocket. So he tries his best to keep his hold on Oliver. However, uh, he fails to do so when on that fateful night of the robbery, which is uh, thwarted, Oliver is abandoned in the ditch and he is rescued. And uh, how uh, later Fagin is arrested, how he is arrested, and in chapter 52 titled The Jews Last Night Alive, Dickens presents a kind of a picture of Fagin where as we see, he is sitting in his solitary cell uh, he, as he is condemned to die. And uh, during this time, he uh, understands the desperate state he had, he was in. So the, at the end of the novel, Fagin, who had tried to destroy Oliver is himself destroyed and his effort to prevent Oliver from knowing the true history of his birth by conspiring with monks it does not materialize and uh, as we can see that uh, when Fagin is hanged 
uh, Dickens also achieves his purpose. What purpose? Uh, actually, by showing the triumph of good over evil. So that is something that Dickens uh, shows us that evil will not survive or will not triumph. So the black soul of this old Jew uh, is ultimately destroyed. So Fagin is like uh, like the devil, and uh, and when he is confronted with good in the shape of the little boy Oliver, he ultimately he has to submit to him. Now uh, Dickens uh, told his biographer John Forster. John Forster was Dickens's biographer. And uh, he has written a very detailed biography of uh, Charles Dickens. He was also his friend. Uh, he has told about Fagin that he's such an out and outer, I don't know what to make of him. So uh, actually, he uh, portrayed Fagin in such a way that he aroused a lot of distaste and a lot of anger in the minds of the readers. So this is uh, actually the portrayal of Fagin and as we can see uh, he is the prime you can say the prime person who is responsible for uh, all the misdeeds all the evil deeds. So uh, he is a master criminal as we can see and he is a trainer trainer of uh, Uthi criminal that is he is going to train the boys under him to become criminals like him and he is uh, the associate of another criminal William Sykes and uh, William Sykes about whom we would be talking about uh, who is a housebreaker and a robber now after Fagin, let us move on to another character who is a very resourceful boy and that is Jack Dawkins or the Artful Dodger. Uh, the Artful Dodger, that is his nickname and uh, he has gained this nickname because he is an expert in the technique of picking pockets. So uh, this is the name that has been given to him by his comrades by his friends because he is an expert in the art of pickpocketing. And Oliver meets this artful dodger uh, just outside London when he is uh, going to London, when he is about to enter London. And the artful dodger introduces him to Fagin and his gang. Now the Artful Dodger, of course, uh, we see how he takes uh, little Oliver on this thieving uh, expedition where they try to rob Mr. Brownlow, but they fail and uh, Oliver is caught and he, is, uh, he goes to, he has, he is taken to the police magistrate, Mr. Fang, and how uh, he is ill-treated there, but since Mr. Brownlow uh, does not press any charge against Oliver, he uh, takes him, he is released. So uh, later on, uh, we see a lot of this character, the Artful Dodger, and we learn about his resourcefulness. And uh, towards the end of the novel, he, uh, as we see, he is a jovial kind of a boy. And later, uh, when he is arrested by the police and he is produced in the court of law uh, for trial, he remains cheerful and he talks in a very light-hearted way and he denounces the judge. He is uh, sentenced to transportation to Australia and he says that he did not expect any kind of justice from the, from the court of law. So he, in a way, condemns the proceedings of the court. So this is the character of the Artful Dodger as we see him in this novel. He is a young 
uh, would be pickpocket and quite a, an adept one at that. The next person is Charlie Bates. Now, Charlie Bates, uh, he is one of the boys working for the old Geo Fagin. And he is also a sprightly young fellow. Uh, and like the Earthful Dodger, he is also an expert in picking pockets. Uh, later in the story, uh, Bates, uh, as we find, he is angry with Bill Sykes, as uh, Sykes uh, had killed Nancy. And Bates, uh, Charlie Bates, is so angry that he attacks Sykes physically, though he is overpowered. So uh, Charlie Bates is another boy who is uh, part of this gang, Fagin's gang. There is one more boy here, uh, uh, that is, he is called Tom Chitling. And uh, he has been trained by Fagin to carry out thefts and robberies. And he has already gone through a prison sentence when we first meet him. Uh, and he is in a relationship with this girl called Betsy, who is Nancy's companion. And often he comes to Fagin's den. Uh, rather, Nancy comes to, uh, Betsy comes to Fagin's den to meet this boy. Now we come to Oliver's half-brother, Monks. And uh, Monks' real name is Edward Leeford. And uh, he is like Oliver, the son of Edwin Leeford. So Edwin Leeford is the father both of Monks, who is, uh, who is older, and Oliver, who is the younger son. But their mothers are different. Uh, Oliver is Edwin Lifford's illegitimate son, but Monks is the legitimate son. So Monks actually harbors a kind of hatred against the boy, Oliver, because he is his half-brother, and he tries his utmost to harm Oliver and to deprive him of his share of his father's property. And Monks is one of the villains in the novel, but ultimately his evil designs against Oliver are thwarted and frustrated by uh, the good gentleman, Mr. Brownlow. And he then uh, goes away to America with his portion uh, of inheritance and there he squanders it and meets a sad end. This person, Monks, is actually portrayed as a person who is subject to fits of epilepsy. And uh, often uh, this attack comes over him. So uh, he is extremely, uh, he can be portrayed, he has been portrayed like an evil character and he is always looking uh, for ways to harm Oliver. The next person that we meet, the evil character, is William Sykes, or Bill Sykes, as he is called. Now, by profession, Bill Sykes, as we have mentioned, he is a housebreaker and a robber. He is quite a formidable man, and in the criminal circles of the city of London, he is quite well known. He is a middle-aged stout man. And he is described as being very fond of drinking. Now, he is an arrogant and haughty kind of a man. And his attitude towards the others are like, uh, you know, he sounds very high-handed and arrogant. He speaks to them in a very bullying and a very condescending kind of a way. Uh, though Fagin is a criminal, master criminal, uh, Sykes treats Fagin as his subordinate. So he does not uh, really show any kind of respect for Fagin because uh, he feels himself to be more important than Fagin. Now, uh, Fagin has to listen to Sykes's dictates and uh, Sykes 
plans a daring burglary in the house of the Maylies. And he takes the boy Oliver to go to the small town where the burglary was to be committed. And uh, the robbery then would be done. But uh, he is, as we can see, he is a planner. He, he, he makes these plans. Though, of course, he does not succeed. He does not succeed. And uh, as we learn, some of his partners in crime have been executed. But for uh, some reason or the other, he has always uh, been able to escape from the clutches of the police. And uh, while Fagin, as we see, he trains the boys for criminal activities, William Sykes actually uh, does the job himself and because he wants to reap a rich reward. And uh, as we can see, Nancy, the, this young girl, he is attached to this villain Sykes. Uh, and when Sykes becomes ill, it is Nancy who uh, narcissist. him. However, uh, he is uh, not really kind towards Nancy and uh, he treats Nancy with great scorn and ultimately to escape from the consequences of his crime, he uh, ultimately murders Nancy. And he tries to escape. His end comes when he gets caught in the rope uh, when he had been trying to escape and he is strangled to death. So uh, his dead body is seen hanging in midair from the rope down which he was trying to slide to the ground. So he meets an end that he richly deserves. So this is the character of Bill Sykes, who is portrayed as a villain and as a uh, one of the evil characters in this novel, Oliver Twist. Now, uh, there remains this young girl called Nancy, who has been brought up from her very childhood in a criminal environment. And uh, she has been taught all the tricks of the criminal trade. And uh, she is uh, actually, she helps Fagin when she recaptures Oliver from the streets. When Oliver uh, is taken to Mr. Brownlow's house and Mr. Brownlow takes care of Oliver for some time. And one day, when he sent uh, to a bookshop to deliver some books, Nancy and uh, another person, they managed to capture him. So uh, he, she brings him back to Fagin's den. However, she is sympathetic towards Oliver and uh, she tries to protect him when Sykes uh, tries to harm him. And as we have seen, she is uh, uh, attached to Bill Sykes. She is not prepared to betray him, no matter what the temptation. And uh, uh, she comes to know from a private conversation between Fagin and Monks that Oliver's life is in danger. And therefore, she rushes to Rose Maley and she informs of about this evil design that Monks is going to harm this boy, harm Oliver. And uh, she meets Rose Maley twice and uh, this action on her part actually brings about her death because it becomes known uh, and William Sykes, he suspects that Nancy has betrayed him. Uh, but in reality, Nancy has not betrayed him at all. She had been faithful to him. She had not reported him against the police. 
but uh, she she had not reported Sykes to the police. That is, uh, but Sykes is very very much suspicious, and he ultimately murders Nancy. So Nancy, uh, she has to uh, come to this violent end. And though she le she lives this life of crime in this criminal environment, really uh, she is a bit different, as we can see from the other characters in this novel. And the way she has to suffer at the hands of the uh, this criminal called William Sykes. So uh, Dickens, actually, as we can see, uh, he was writing this novel where he had portrayed the London underworld and the people who inhabited this London underworld. And his purpose, as we know, he wanted to show or bring before his readers a picture of the London underworld. Now, some of those readers, they did not like this because they said that it, they did not want to hear about the people, such people who were criminals. But uh, Dickens's purpose was to make them aware of the activities, the evil activities that they were performing. Now, uh, Dickens uh, Dickens's novel, uh, uh, some of his, some of the critics have said that he has made uh, crime look glamorous, or he had really uh, made these criminals to be attractive creatures or fascinating creatures, but that is not so. Actually, he has portrayed them as disgusting and repugnant. And uh, he has painted crime and the criminals in all its deformity, in all their wretchedness. So uh, actually, it has uh, uh, this novel has been uh, it has done a great deal for society. And uh, during those times. A series of novels became quite popular and they were called the Newgate novels. The Newgate novels, uh, you know, they were certain novels uh, which were also called the Old Bailey novels and they were published in England between uh, from the late 1820s until the 1840s. And uh, in these novels, the novelists what they did was to glamorize the lives of the criminals they portrayed there. And they drew their inspiration from the Newgate calendar. And uh, that was a biography of the famous criminals that were published at various times during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, uh, there were such novels as Richmond, which was published in 1827, and The History of George Godfrey, published in 1828, and Edward Bulwer Lytton, uh, who was a Victorian novelist, published Paul Clifford in 1830, and Eugene Aaron in 1832. William Harrison Ainsworth published Rookwood in 1834 which featured a, a villain called Dick Darpin. And uh, there was another novel called Jack Shepard, which was published in 1839, which was based on the life and exploits of this person called Jack Shepard, who was a thief. And he, was, uh, uh, he had been hanged in uh, 1729. So his life was made into a novel. So uh, actually, uh, these novels glorified 
glorified uh, the lives of the criminals. And uh, Dickens was not doing that. Dickens was actually showing the criminals in his book in all their vile natures and in all their ugliness. So uh, he was portraying first the localities, the filthy localities where they lived. In trying to depict the life of the criminals, he uh, first portrayed the filthy place where Fagin and his boys lived. And the street in which the Jew's house is situated is very narrow and muddy. And the whole area is full of filthy odors. The children in that locality, they are described as crawling in and out of the houses or screaming from the inside. And the whole place is so squalid that Oliver is, uh, of course, he feels like running away from there when he first reaches there. And the room where Fagin the Jew lives, it is described as a dirty room. It is a dismal and a dreary room. And therefore, uh, we can see how Charles Dickens is presenting before his readers the dwelling places of these criminals and the criminals themselves. So, he did not have any sympathy for the criminals and he was not really going to portray them in a glorious way. So, the crimes they are committing, those are condemned. And uh, as we can see that uh, Dickens portrays these criminals as having a kind of a fear, the fear of being arrested. And they are haunted by the fear of the police because of the possibility that the police might come to know the whereabouts of their hiding place. So when Oliver uh, is uh, taken care of in Mr. Brownlow's house temporarily, Fagin is anxious to have him back because he fears that Oliver would report him and he would be arrested. And uh, therefore, we can see that these people, these criminals in the novel, they are always very apprehensive. And of course, uh, the sad fate, ultimately how the criminals are portrayed, these people of the underworld, their sad fates are ultimately portrayed, how Fagin is hanged, Sykes is uh, sort of hanged uh, accidentally. And uh, there is this, uh, how Nancy is murdered and uh, the artful dodger is transported. So all these things, you know, the ultimate consequences, what happens to these criminals. So we can really uh, see how uh, these people are ultimately, they are, they meet their, you know, ends. And the novelist is not at all interested in glamorizing them. He is showing them in all their sordid natures, in all their cruelty and their wickedness. So Oliver Twist is a kind of a gloomy book in that sense. It is a book which has been called a gloomy book and uh, Somehow, somewhat not very suitable for readers because he portrays the inhabitants of the other world. 
and the lesson that Charles Dickens wants to convey to his readers is the fact that crime never pays, that the criminals will be brought to book sooner or later. And uh, this is a kind of, you can say, a moral or a didactic book, a didactic book where the novelist tries to impart some kind of a lesson to the readers. He wants to show the fact that the criminals and the criminal activities that have been portrayed here, those activities actually would not be tolerated and they would not succeed ultimately. They would be punished by the authorities. So, of course, we can in conclusion say that Dickens's portrayal of the underworld, the London underworld is quite vivid. It is quite, uh, you can say, uh, quite uh, successful in this way because he has shown us, shown his readers the way the underworld of London operated. So this is uh, one of the topics that we have discussed today and I will uh, give you one note, uh, I'll give, uh, give you some notes and uh, another topic that is there, that is the ending of the novel, which I will uh, give it to you in your group. So uh, let us stop here.